take it that you're interested in seeing a very enlightening presentation, and yet the first thing I'm going to ask you to do is to close your eyes for a moment. Yes. And now I'm going to guide you through a, a few more things, if you're willing and able. I want you to focus on my voice with your eyes closed. And just think about the tone of my voice. Uh, is it trembling because I have such a full room with so much anticipation? Uh, think about if you're able to understand the, the next requests I'm going to give to you. Uh, think about where you are in the room. Where is your seat located? And think for a moment about why did you come today? What was your motivation? Maybe it wasn't your decision entirely. Maybe you came with a partner who kind of egged you on. Maybe you know that York Circle has wonderful refreshments and you tend to get hungry and so, wonderful. You're, you'd say your stomach led you. Um, and I'd like you to think about a time when you were pleasantly surprised. Maybe someone gave you a little gift or just said thank you when you weren't expecting it. Uh, I came in the wrong doorway this morning and, uh, and there was someone near that wrong door that I thought wouldn't open it for me, but then she turned around and did and I thought, wow, I was pleasantly surprised. And now I'd like you to think about a time when you've made a rash decision and afterwards you regretted it and you think, I should have known. In that moment when she opened the door after I got in, I saw it was a fire exit and I felt that maybe I should have spent a minute more to see why it said it was closed and not set her up for setting off a fire alarm. And on this Saturday, you might have been uh, watching some of the Olympic athletes this week. So I'd like you to think about some of the feats of the Olympic athletes can you picture anyone who's done something that if you try to imagine yourself doing, you think of how difficult it would be, the control or timing that they had over their body? Okay, and now I'm going to ask you to open your eyes. And now I'm going to ask you to look around and, and pay attention to the shapes and the colors that you're seeing. Think of the objects and how they're laid out, who's in the room, and if I ask you to look directly at my face, how long does it take you to do that? I think you accomplished that before I even finish the sentence. Computers have a lot of difficulty doing some of these things. So detecting faces in a room, if you could see my view now, I could very quickly pick out your bright and attentive faces. Uh, and computers struggle to do this, although we're making progress in that domain. And actually, when we think about seeing, you often think it's your eyes that did that job. But actually, those are your neurons. Those are your neurons that are allowing you to see. Those Olympic athletes have to be typically in pretty good physical condition. Part of that physical condition means muscle fitness. A part of it's cardiovascular fitness often. But they also have to have what they call muscle memory that their movements go exactly the way they need to go, exactly when, and with precisely the right amount of force for them to accomplish their goal. And that's also the neurons that are controlling those movements. If you've ever had a negative emotion, a positive emotion, if you've ever been pleasantly surprised, if you think about the decisions, the many decisions you make every day, some of them rash, some of them that you regret, some of them bang on. If we go back and think about why you came, and that some of you may have been hungry, you say that's your stomach telling you, but actually your stomach is signaling to your neurons, and it's your neurons that are telling you. So these roughly 85 billion neurons communicating to each other, they're charged with some of the most exquisite and amazing feats. And as you can imagine, with so many neurons somehow all communicating, a lot of things can go awry. So scientists like myself have taken it upon ourselves to try to figure out exactly where and how are neurons communicating with each other to subserve some of these most exquisite functions. So today, 
I'm going to focus on a subset of these functions. And to get there, I'm going to take you through, initially, a little tutorial <coughs> on the communication of neurons at a very basic and microscopic level. And then we can talk a little bit about the signs and signals of plasticity. So plasticity <coughs> is the word that we give to a neural memory, how it is that neurons change the effectiveness or strength of their communication signals. And then we can consider ways that we can change that conversation. <coughs> to start with, I'm going to have you look at an image, and we'll come back to it. So let's make sure you can see this flickering picture. It looks like it's flashing over and over again. That's not all that's happening. In alternation, there's something in this image that's appearing and disappearing. So it's there and gone, there and gone. OK, when you see it, just raise your hand. That way I'll know about how much time to give. And if you don't, by all means, it's difficult. So trust me, there is something. This isn't a trick. OK, some people are starting to see it. So now I can guide your attention towards the center of the image. And I can say that it's not the people, but a part of the plane. Ha <laughs> ha! Great. If you have your hands up, you can put your hands down. OK, so now I'll show it to you. So this spot here, and this spot here. I love this reaction. I just love it. Yeah. And, and the O, what's neat about the O isn't just it's there, but it stays there. How could you not have seen that? It was there all along. And these sorts of tasks, it's amazing. You can do it in real life with real people. So you can have, for example, if I were uh, having you come up here to sign a form, and I pretend to duck down to get a, an extra piece of paper, and I have a confederate, another person in on the prank, down who comes up. So it's a new person giving you this form. <laughs> Roughly half of the people who experience that experiment will not notice that it's a new person. <laughs> so clearly our neurons aren't always doing uh, the best job, but it's special circumstances that it takes to trick them. All right, I'm going to come back to this image, but the thing that I want you to uh, uh, think about this is now that you've seen it, how you respond, how you behave in terms of this image. So namely that you basically can't miss that center part changing and you're drawn to look at it. OK. So let's talk a little bit about how neurons communicate. Believe it or not, neurons communicate through electrical impulses. Electricity, uh, like what happens if you stick your tongue on a battery and you feel a little bit of a jolt. Yes, so charged particles moving around actual electricity. So if we zoom in here, the electrical impulses from one neuron, like this, get delivered to another neuron through something called a synapse. I'm not going to test you on this at the end. What happens at, the, at this end is this electrical impulse, so charged particles, trigger the release of something called a neurotransmitter chemicals. Those chemicals cross over to the next cell, downstream, and those chemicals open up what we call ion channels. They open up the cell to change the flow of more charged particles. They generate electricity again. So it goes electricity into the synapse with a little puff of chemicals, and then those chemicals are received, and you have more electrical transmission. Neurons are not particularly inclined to fire this impulse down the axon. They actually have to receive at this input area, this input's called the dendrite, they have to receive many inputs that they integrate in time, and then they make a decision. Now, I'm not suggesting it's like a homunculus, a little man or a little woman or a little child, in there making a decision. It's basically weighing ion gradients. So it doesn't have to kind of pontificate and scratch its chin. It's really measuring how much 
uh, depolarization, how much excitation am I getting through electrical energy? And if I get enough, I will fire. And when I fire, I will be releasing chemicals downstream. If I don't get enough, then I won't fire. So every neuron has to make that decision, and it's able to make that decision at most, for brief periods of time, a thousand times a second. Okay, can't sustain that rate, but that's at least that rate of recovery. All right, so that's a lot of impulses. I mentioned 85 billion neurons. Each one has 10,000 of those synapses, give or take an order of magnitude. So that also varies very much. So these synapses matter because they contribute to that decision making of whether you're going to get further communication or whether that will get cut off. Okay. Just like electricity out there in the environment, we can measure electrical activity. And it has properties that are kind of like sound energy. So I like to make that analogy if you're not as familiar with how the electricity would work. So if we consider the activity of this neuron, the dendrites would be up here and the decision maker that's receiving it all would be down here. And it contains a difference in charged particles, an electrical gradient, that gets changed when it gets an input from this upstream cell. The lines that you see drawn here are fields. They're drawn like a topo map, like when you're looking at a map that has elevation charted out, but instead of elevation, it's showing you how much of that charge you can see. And that charge, like sound energy, it falls with distance. So there are different ways that we can record this activity, but among them we need to calculate the ions here compared to here, the charged particle difference, and if we can record a difference, then we can record, the ch record those changes in electrical impulses in the cell. Now, because it falls with distance, the farther away we are from these cells, and these cells are very small, uh, the less we hear. So, where measurements across the neuron give the greatest voltage, or this electrical potential, there is a cheat we have on the system. Because it would be very limiting if we always only could just go inside of a cell and outside to record that. The cheat is, if neurons are aligned, these fields add up. They summate. So I'm going to have you guys give me a little demonstration, because it is sort of like sound energy. And I think we might be able to get the same thing if we, if we can try to do this as controlled as possible. As a scientist, we like controlled experiments. So what I'd like you to do is, as randomly as you can, um, just clap your hands. Great. And now, and now I'm going to do it again. But let's do it in time. And again, try it yourself. If you, if you can, keep it to the same volume, the same strength of clap. So if I ask you to go like this, in time with me. Very good, okay. I don't have the decibel meter, but when we do that in sync, that sound energy aligns and it's actually louder. So the overall, of course, it's also quieter when we don't, right? So it's louder and then quieter, but when, compared to when you were doing the random, that, that uh, sound energy is greater, and so too. If the inputs come in in sync, and the cells are aligned so that these fields summate, they add up, then we actually can measure the activity of what's happening inside this group of cells. We get kind of a local mass signal. Fortunately, in a lot of parts of the brain, the cells do line up this way, and their inputs, their synapses, um, are also aligned and stimulated, sometimes in sync. So we have the conditions that we would need to record this. What I'm showing you here are fluorescence labeled cells in an actual brain. This is a cartoon, and in this cartoon model, this would be the cell body of a neuron and a few other neurons, you can record in the cell, you can record the impulses that go down that axon, but you can also see the wiggles that are sub-threshold that don't lead to an action potential. We can also re record outside these cells and notice that we can pick up on the same sorts of fluctuations that we saw inside that cell is present across that small population. So we can do these local field potential recordings. Well, I'll, I'll show you some of these. And also uh, records of the individual spiking of the neuron. 
Okay. That's the end of the quick tutorial on how the neurons communicate, so that hopefully this will help you understand uh, some of the images that I'm going to show you next. We want to know about, in this communication, what would be the signs and signals of plasticity? How is it that the input and output of the cells can be modified? Okay. Donald Hebb was a Canadian psychologist who, uh, back in the 50s, before we really knew a lot about how these cells were communicating, he dreamed up an idea. It really was an idea, this theory. And this idea was that the cells that fire together might wire together. So if you think of a child who's learning language, sees the sight of a ball and has a parent say, ball. Well, those things go together. The parent doesn't point at something that's not a ball and say, ball, right? Uh, in fact, those things tend to co-occur. And so the thought was that neurons that would originally respond to the sight of the ball would also uh, uh, lead to downstream areas and fire downstream neurons. Those downstream neurons might also be innervated by receive signals from some auditory areas that give a weak signal for ball. Who knows what that means? Too weak to fire the neuron. But if they happen together, ball and then the side of the ball is also there to fire the neuron. The fact that that downstream neuron fires makes it kind of seek out, hey, who is active up there at my dendrites? Which ones of you? And it notices that, hey, the sound of ball was also active. So the sound of ball and the side of ball, huh, let me strengthen that guy because that guy is predictive of what this guy also predicts. So we'd strengthen that synapse, thereby learning when you hear the sound alone, ball, you can visualize the ball, and you know what's being referred to. And this was just a th almost like a thought experiment at that stage. He made other predictions, uh, and in the end, uh, that became a, a rather fundamental principle of how cells may change their activity with learning. In this image, this is just a schematic drawing of the neurons, but that mass action causes them to fire in synchrony, and a subset of them will fire in a particular order during a certain experience. And we've seen that these groups of neurons, I'm going to call them neural cliques, they sort of form their own little well, click or club so that when you have that experience or recalling that experience again, those same cells fire. So you can reliably get just that subset. Now, any one cell like this guy here, he may be part of more clicks. And you notice, and this is no accident, that in the schematic there are a lot of cells that aren't firing for this particular episode or instance. They might so fire for other things. So simply knowing how many cells here are active doesn't tell you what's being signaled. It's the players, the clicks, that give it the identity. To see those clicks, these neural clicks, we need to be able to understand which of those neurons, we call them single units, which of those neurons are firing and in which local groups. That becomes something that's hard to see in some of the methods that get more zoomed out, like EEG, where you can see major changes in huge masses of brain tissue, but the specific messaging can be difficult to discern. Okay. So, how can we measure these neural clicks that could change this conversation, uh, their conversation, during learning? Well, we need a good learning task from which to observe such things. And so now I'll come back to this. Can you guys uh, locate the changing item? I'm already too late. By the time I finish the sentence, not only is it a yes, you're probably looking at it. Right. Well, we're using this test as a proxy for a test that they've been doing for a long time in rodents, in rats and mice. So rats and mice are some of the subjects, preferred subjects for some psychological studies in ways that they can measure learning and memory. And in those tasks, they've had the animal from a bird's eye view, they've had that animal swim around in a tank to find a hidden platform. And you can see that the first time you put them in, if you put out the, skin, the, the swim path, it's pretty long. The animal doesn't quite know where to go. But with learning, this is called the Morris water maze. And with learning, you can see a much more direct path. And so we thought, well, you know, we actually don't explore our environment the same way rats do. And our brains are a little bit different. 
Maybe we can capitalize on how our brains are different. When we talk about our memories, we think about uh, finding a particular episode among many, a particular situation when something happened. So in our mental space, it's a, 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 an individual object in a, a cluttered mental space, or finding our keys in a room. Where did I put my keys? Or where did I park my car? And we're also very visually motivated. When you walk in a room, you don't do what a rodent does. Do you know what a rodent would do when they walk in a room? If we did it, it would be pretty funny because they have these nice whiskers. And so what they do is they actually whisk around the periphery. They go around like, oh yeah, what's this? Ooh, what's that? Oh, they got an edge, you know? And, and then they'll come up and kind of smell, sniff around, seeing what's happening. Can you imagine if we did that? <laughs> so we are very visually oriented. And even as we're exploring an environment, we often move our whole bodies and heads just to get another view around a corner. And so this task is capitalizing on that idea that we use vision, uh, and not only vision, but that we are dominated by vision in terms of our uh, formation of, of locating objects in the environment and forming memories of these things. So in our task, which you saw an example of, we had items that were appearing and disappearing, and the yellow square here is the giveaway. The first time it's shown, you see the scan path of where someone looked on a computer monitor, and it took them a long time to find the item. And when we show it again, if they report remembering, they're really fast at it. And this is another example. So you can see that people get much faster at the task um, when it's repeated and they remember. They aren't as good when they forget. So we tested different populations and found that if we plot search time here, so if you were really fast, like that second time, you'd be in this spot. And if we ask you, did you remember or forget, uh, for the healthy adults that we tested, did you remember the object in the scene or not? They did forget sometimes, and when they forgot, their search times were much longer than when they remembered. Now this is, having done the task, this is probably intuitive to you, right? It was very, uh, almost effortless for you to locate that object. Well. Uh, if you look at this dotted line here, we were able to test this remarkable individual. Uh, he's, he's very accomplished, he's very bright, um, and he was really uh, uh, very eager to, to cooperate in the task, which was wonderful. Uh, he did have this issue that um, he would tell the same jokes over and over again. And you could notice that as we, as we went. Uh, we went to lunch to take a break from this, and I noticed that he'd started to walk off without his, um, without his fanny pack, which had his money in it. Uh, it had just slipped his mind, and that wasn't a one-off occurrence. Uh, it turns out this individual uh, had damage bilaterally, so in both hemispheres, to a structure called the hippocampus. And when we gave him this task, even if we only gave him a few images in a row, we'd go back and repeat, and we'd do this again and again. He would do marvelous at the novel part of the task. He would do as well as his aged match uh, colleagues or compatriots, right? He could find the items as a novel trial okay, meaning he struggled the same way you and I do. But he had no benefit of repetition, and he had no explicit memory for that. Every trial we repeated, he'd say he was seeing it for the first time. So this told us that actually we've identified one brain structure in a circuit of structures whose cells are somehow changing with this task, with learning in this task. So we decided to go there, target this area, with the recordings and ask whether the memory would modulate this structure, the hippocampus, the hippocampal activity during visual search. So this is one example um, where we looked at the activity. Uh, in this case, you're seeing the brain uh, scanned from one of the epilepsy patients that's being treated downtown at Toronto Western Hospital. We did this with our collaborator, Tofik Valiente. He's the head of their epilepsy clinic uh, at uh, Toronto Western. And for clinical reasons, these individuals have uh, an epilepsy where they're eligible for resection. So it's called intractable epilepsy. Medication is not solving their problems. And they need to locate precisely where the source of that activity is. And for those clinical reasons, it's a rare opportunity to actually record in their brain directly this neural response or neural activity. And so with their consent, while they uh, went about this procedure, again, they're scouting out where the focus of the seizures are. 
we ran them on this task. And they actually did very well on the task. And we had a sorting criteria in terms of looking at the neural activity for people whose hippocampi were not sclerosed. So they appeared to be healthy. And um, if they can't localize which hemisphere beforehand, then they might do this neurosurgical implant on both sides and then learn that one side is the particular culprit. In which case, the other side, uh, it's still coming from uh, a brain that has been receiving probably many years of seizures. So it's not quite fair to call it healthy, but we know it's not the source of their seizures. So it gives us a very rare chance to see what that signal might look like. And when we do that, well, you can see the search. These are on novel trials, so they do a good job with search. And what we find is here, this hot spot. The hot spot means you have elevated activity and in a particular neural frequency during search. So this lower frequency, it's set in hertz. That's how many times a second something happens. I told you how fast the spiking is. So what we're seeing here is similar to something that had been reported in rats when rats are exploring. But this was the first time this task had been, done, had been shown with humans, and humans are showing this 3 to 8 hertz rhythm. So that frequency would be about pada 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 about that fast. That's slow in brain terms. And it's interesting because that's a rhythm that's slow enough that even long range connections across areas could get synchronized because it takes longer for the impulse to travel. So you can synchronize long stretches of brain with that activity. So that was our first hint that maybe during search part of good learning requires this sort of grouping of cells into these time windows of more like 100 milliseconds or so. If we chunk them together in time, you'll recall cells that fire together wire together. So maybe that's setting up conditions for the cells to help fire in synchrony. That wasn't the only thing we saw. We also saw something that's at the other end of the spectrum. And I actually showed you an example of it before. I showed you ripples. So ripples are traditionally described and reported for periods of quiescence, feeding, now I'm saying grooming, and already you're probably like, grooming? Yes, this is something that's been observed in rodents. So rodents have that grooming behavior. If you have cats, you've probably seen them lick themselves. That's grooming. Um, it's seen during slow wave sleep, and more recently it can appear in rodents as they're performing a spatial memory task. Um, these uh, hippocampal cells that form the neural clicks, they do that neural click replay specifically when you see this. Again, this is in rodents. So when rodents are running around and you see a neural click for a particular location, not for other locations, you can see that location being replayed, but when it's replayed, it's restricted to this time window when you get this highly synchronous, high frequency ripple activity. Even more intriguing, if you block the progression of sharp wave ripples, you see that there are memory impairments. Again, this is also in rodents. So how would that relate to other mammalian brains, including primates like humans? Well, we know sharp wave ripples occur in human and non-human primates, and we know that they occur during the time windows when memories are consolidated. But other than that, it's still largely a mystery. So hopefully what you can see here is a big red band. Okay, That big red band is showing you the energy in the ripple frequency. So this has been time locked to a ripple. And we've recorded this ripple activity, not just during sleep when memories can be consolidated, but for the first time we saw it. Let's see if I can get this. Hopefully this will play for you. What I'm showing, I'm going to pause it just so you can see what's happening. You've noticed the flickering screen. There's something changing here in the screen. And you're seeing the scan path, so where the eyes are looking. And this is the brain activity that's happening in the hippocampus as the eyes are darting about and scanning, trying to find the changing item. 
And what you'll see is this will change color, there you go, as a ripple comes. So when you see it change color, you know a ripple's about to appear, but you can also track where the eyes are. Why I'm showing it with the eye movements is this is not just a passive, after the fact sort of thing, like a reminder signal, go and remember something afterwards. This is happening during the task. So again, we're seeing these sharp wave ripple actions in the hippocampus during active exploration. And we think that having it there may help facilitate memories. We're still in the process to, to determine that, which would be you need to somehow increase or decrease their appearance at that point you, without changing other activity. Then you could say it's causally related. Right now we know that there's a correlation in there that seems interesting. So how can we use some of, this, uh, uh, some of these ideas in thinking about changing the conversation? So this is the last section. And, and to do, talk about changing the conversation, we know from other models that that kind of activity set thing, sets things up for plasticity, where people have looked in slices and they use those kinds of oscillations. They can measure the inputs and outputs of those cells and show that they've changed, that their synapses are growing in number, that the neurotransmitters are received by more of these ion channel receptors. So that makes us very excited just to see that those same sorts of things are happening, um, not just in rodent, not just in the slice. So for this, I have some different examples for you at the behavioral level, since I can't explore directly all of your neurons inside your head. But I want to think about the ways more generally that clearly your neurons must be changing their activity. So the way I'm going to do that right now is have you try to remember these words. Okay. I'll have you look at them. I'll go ahead and read them to you, but you're free to look around at them as I read them off. Desk, couch, sit, sofa, rocking, legs, seat, stool, cushion, bench, swivel, recliner, sitting, table, wood. Okay, please don't write them down. That would kind of defeat the purpose. <laughs> Can you tell that I, I, you know, I'm a teacher, I get that, yeah. Hmm. Okay, now I'm going to switch gears. So here will be an example that seems more perception related, but, but the way we think of what the neurons must be doing, we realize we must be changing their conversation. And I'll explain why. Um, if you see kind of maybe dotted figures here, there's a light patch up here and here, and it's kind of darker here, but otherwise, ooh, funny dotty pattern. Or, instead of just funny dotty pattern, there actually is something that's dotty. Something that's dotty in an animal. It's dotty in an animal, and what if it's kind of facing away from you and heading toward a tree? And it's a Dalmatian. It's a Dalmatian whose head is down, floppy ear, you can see one of the floppy ears, heading towards that tree. And if you haven't seen it, so here would be like a head and the front leg and then the tail end. Yeah? Okay. And now that you see it, kind of like before, it's kind of hard to unsee it. This picture is not what it was before. And that might seem like an easy example. Well, I need something of an easy and effective example to be able to pull it off in this context. But in a very serious sense, there are cells in your brain that are responsive when you see dogs. And most of you would understand if I say uh, that I have a Dalmatian, the kind of image you could con conjure up in your head would be accurate. You'd have an idea of that white dog with black spots. Maybe think of a firehouse or things like this. Uh, and, and when you do that, we know uh, from, again, these fairly rare recordings in human that even when you ask someone to conjure up the image of somebody or you recite their name, that cells that respond to the visual image of, say, like Jennifer Aniston would be one example, a real-life example they've used. The mere name, the mere sound of her name, or having you imagine her is sufficient to get these cells to fire, which means that when you first saw this image, there was nothing about a Dalmatian in there, I would hazard a guess. And as you perceive the Dalmatian, that changed. The way you are seeing this image now, and meaning the way your neurons are communicating to tell you what this is, has changed. 
In this case, we call that top-down guidance because I told you, and so kind of from the inside out or top-down, it's not the dark and light spots bottom-up from out there coming in is called bottom-up. Instead, it's a more conceptual level that you were instructed or you remembered, and that guided the signal. So that guidance is one way that learning changes the conversation among neurons. Okay. Now, which, don't say that out loud, please, because I don't want you to ruin it for the person beside you. If you have a look and see which word is new, it's one word that's added. If you noticed how many we had before, there's now one extra. Okay, so just think to yourself. I know you guys are very you're wonderful. You're really eager. And, and I'm, I'm curious how well this will work as well because it's a slightly different uh, situation than um, the typical way that this, this game would be played. Okay, I'm gonna give you the answer. Okay, I guess by the response that it, it worked at least for some of you. And this is also important. So if you know what's happening, the effectiveness of this is reduced, so there are some tricks to this game. But the point is we have cognitive illusions like visual illusions. We have memory illusions. And those memory illusions can be quite profound in the real world. This was a list of words. And if you thought chair was there, the way we set this problem up, the magician in this case can show the trick, is by putting up words that are very similar. They're words surrounding chair. And so when I tell you recliner and legs and seat, what, what comes up, what conjures up in your mind? Well, what is that? That's memory. So there are neurons that reflect chair that when I say these other things, it's supporting that activity. It's supporting that click that re uh, represents chair. So much so that when I show you this, if you don't know the trick, then odds are you see chair and think, actually that would probably be the most, uh, the, the, the first item selected as being repeated, not the new one. And this principle holds for, like I say, it, it, it extends beyond just wordless. Uh, if you think of the basis of stereotypes, for example, when you're given examples around a theme, you can believe that you've seen the theme, the center point. If you've seen correlations or things that you perceive are associated with other things and you get triggered by the associates, you mistakenly take the most frequent kind of center point. And that happens a lot. It also happens in face processing. You can play the same trick showing different faces and then showing a face that was never shown before but that geometrically lands at the center of associated faces. So it's quite a pervasive effect, and it's a way that our neurons are tricking us. But anytime they're tricking us, it gives us some insight as to what they're doing. And in this case, it suggests these neural clicks are highly associative. And we can change that conversation, even in somewhat simple ways here. So the last thing that I want to do is give you a more concrete idea of where we're going with this. So, I mentioned this area of the brain that we know is somehow related to learning these objects and scene memory to what we call episodic memory, knowing where something is in the environment or when it happened in your own mind relative to other events. How it's happening is still largely a mystery, but it's an area that becomes quite dysfunctional with neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's disease. There's a first of its kind phase two clinical trial where uh, some patients downtown who have Alzheimer's disease uh, are undergoing a deep brain stimulation treatment that is thought to affect the hippocampus. And what we're trying to do now is to figure out the secret recipe, to figure out what would be the right way to change the conversation among those neurons to help bring back, to help alleviate some of the memory loss. It's a tall order. It's a double-blind study, and we don't know if this first pass will be effective. And indeed, uh, my colleague, Andre Sozano, who's the neurosurgeon in charge of that project, has been very forthcoming about the need to find out what would the best parameters be, because we don't know yet. And that's where I'm joining the team to try to help our understanding 
with sensitive memory tasks for this hippocampal function and to try out different parameters that might work better for these patients. And so I want to finish with a video that gives you a bigger picture. One of the reasons we do this. Hi, this I'm is for Andrew. Parkinson's. I'm 39 years old and I suffer from Parkinson's disease. Uh, I was diagnosed four years ago when I was 35 and uh, I've since undergone deep brain stimulation surgery. Um, this is a procedure whereby two probes are dropped deep into my brain and hooked up via a, a wire down my neck to a pacemaker in my chest. This provides a steady stream of electricity to my brain um, per second. So um, it has had a major effect on my life and uh, a major effect on my family's life, which is the main thing. And um, today I'd like to show you what happens when I turn my neurostimulator off. Now, it's just after 11 a.m., so it's um, time that I had my second dose of medication for the morning. Um, so my first dose is pretty much all but worn off. So this is a, a good example of what I'd be like when I'd be sort of off-off uh, with no medication in my system and no power. Uh, to show you the dramatic effect, um, I will demonstrate. This is me with the power on. I'm not making happy little faces for the video. These are tests that the neurologists make us do to test our reflexes. As you can see they're wiggling, moving fine, and I've got very good movement. Um, this is the remote control and this checks that I'm on. On and OK. And this is me when I turn it off. Uh, you won't be able to read that, it's shaking too much. So it's almost an instantaneous reaction. I can't control this. shake some quality cocktails with the right, the left just looks like the royal wave. Um, my voice is gone, it's harder for me to get, get words out and speak. I'm completely rigid and if I tried to stand up I'd fall. Um, if anyone thinks I'm faking this, um, I'm not. Um, I can't control the tremors in dyskinesia. The twisting in my neck is called dystonia and is really quite uncomfortable. Um, so, as you can see, the tremors are getting much worse and I'm in quite a bit of discomfort. And I'm about to drop the remote control, which will be fun because I won't be able to turn myself back on. So I think party time is over. Um, oh, almost automatically. The power comes back on. I'm steady. So. If anyone's considering DBS, I thoroughly recommend it. It uh, is life changing. Thanks. Thank you.